Hello everybody, welcome to my Shalom Zone. My name is Sherry Dawn and it's my great honor and privilege to share this grace encounter with you today. Isaiah 33 and verse 22 tells us that God is our judge, he's our lawgiver, and he's our king, but it ends by saying he will save you. So it is my great honor and my delight to get to share with people the truth that the fact that God is your judge is not something that, that should give you the hippie-jibbies or put you in fear and terror. God is our judge, and he ruled in our favor at the cross. So when you receive Jesus as your Savior, God sees you in him. He sees you as the spirit of a righteous man made perfect. And you can find scripture for that in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 23 and Hebrews 10 and verse 14 and others that I'm not going to go into right now because that's a, an entirely different teaching. But you need to know and understand God's not dealing with you based on how your flesh behaves at different times. Now, that's the enemy's territory. He's always going to be raising accusations against you because of what you did and throwing up to you the fact that you're guilty because of what you did. And yes, that's true. Except for the fact that if you're in Christ Jesus, Jesus has already been punished for what you did. Your trespass has already been imputed to him and his righteousness has already been imputed to you. So God gets to rule in your favor regardless of how your flesh just acted. That's a reason to rejoice. We're not guilty because our guilt was transferred to Christ. Now we're not going to use this as an excuse to just get out and act like a complete heathen and a fool. No. When you understand you're forgiven because Jesus already paid the penalty, your heart is changed and you want to live your life in a way that honors him and delights him and pleases him. Satan is not your judge. And I said all that to say this, Satan, is not your judge. Now he's the accuser and he never shuts up and he won't until he's put in the pit. But he cannot make those accusations stick when you understand who you are in Christ Jesus and that you are forgiven and that you are made righteous. He's not authorized to punish you. And when people understand this and they begin to get hold of the truth of the power of forgiveness, then they're able to resist the accuser and his accusations. And it is still written in the book of Revelation chapter 12. We overcame the accuser. We have to overcome at the level of the accusations. We overcame the accuser by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony, and we love not our lives unto the death. So our purpose in this channel is to share that kind of good news. So I would appreciate it very much if you would like and share. If you have not already subscribed, please subscribe. Decree with me. I am redeemed and I say so. Satan has no lawful jurisdiction over me or my family. And I say so. Jesus Christ is my righteousness. And I say so. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. And I say so. All who war against me shall come to nothing. And I say so. I am expecting grace explosions of healing and deliverance and restoration, and I say so. Jesus is Lord. We are under grace. Fallen angels are perishing, and the word of God grows mightily and prevails. Amen, amen, amen. Now, every one of those statements are taken from scriptures. The scripture tells us, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. You can find that in Psalm 107 and verse 2. The scripture tells us, no weapon formed against us shall prosper because he's our righteousness. You'll find that in Isaiah 54, 17. And when the scripture says that uh, those who gather together against us or those who war against us shall perish, you'll find that in Isaiah 41, verses 11 and 12. It's all in there. But I want you to know and to understand, when you speak those kinds of things out, it causes something to happen to your spirit on the inside. You are strengthened. You are emboldened. You stand up because you're declaring the truth. But it's also activating holy angels 
to carry out those things that you're decreeing. So make sure you say the covenant truths of God because His words are living words. Speak those living words over yourself and over your family. Okay, today, I want us to take a look at Psalm 23. A lot of times, even people that have never been born again yet are familiar with this psalm because they hear it so many times at funerals. But I don't want you to think of this psalm only in the connotation of somebody's funeral. There's power in this psalm. And I want you to be able to see that and get hold of that and just rejoice in that and live in expectation of good things because of it, regardless of, of where we are on the prophetic timeline. Regardless, we can still have good days because Christ is still on the throne. Psalm 23, I'm going to read the thing in its entirety, and then I'm going to go back and do some commenting. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Can't help what he's doing there, buddy, else, but this is where he leads me. I put that in. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Oh, I love it. Now, back up to verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. And it's going to stop right there. Because so many times when we think shepherd, we immediately think of flock of sheep just going, you know, scattering like a covey of quail all over the hillside and two or three dogs turned loose to round them up. Now, that's, that's a wonderful thing. You know, that's the way they do it in Australia. That's the way they do it in the United States. That's the way they do it in other different places. But this was written about Middle Eastern shepherds. And they don't do their sheep that way, okay? Or they didn't at this time. Middle Eastern shepherding at this time was done by shepherds leading the sheep. And they did it with their voice, by talking to the sheep. The Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 3 and 4, Jesus was speaking. And he tells us that the sheep hear the voice of the shepherd. And he calls them by name and leads them out. And when he puts forth his sheep, he goes before them. So there's that picture of him leading them. And the sheep follow him because they can see so well, not so much. They follow him because they know his voice. So get this in your thinking. See the shepherd out front talking gently to the sheep. Sometimes they would sing to the sheep. But the sheep get used to the sound of that voice, and that's what they follow. And then as we read the rest of this, we realize everything that the shepherd does is for the good of the sheep. He leads them to food and water. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Still waters is so important because sheep, if they're drinking from where the water is real troubled and boiling or whatever, they lean down to drink their their wool gets soggy and it can pull them under so the shepherd is always very conscious of leading them to places where the water is still and sheep won't rest if they're agitated so he leads them into places where they can rest because that's how they're best able to grow and to produce the best wool so he's mindful of his sheep everything he does is for their benefit he's the scripture said he restores my soul the Hebrew word used for soul there means your vitality. God is interested in restoring your vitality, your ability to get up and go and face another day. And it's just a good practice to lay down at night when you go to sleep and ask Him, Lord, restore my vitality while I sleep. And then when you wake up in the morning, thank Him for restoring your vitality, whether you're feeling restored or not. As you move out in faith on that, you're going to find out. You start feeling better throughout that I've had it happen to me over and over and over again, where I feel like I had been run over by a truck when I first woke up. I did not want to rejoice. I did not want to praise the Lord. I did not want to encourage other people. I wanted to just curl up in a ball and let the world go by 
but I've learned in the process of time that when the Lord reveals these things and I begin to act on those things in faith, it won't be very long until my whole attitude changes. And then when my attitude changes and my thinking changes, my body comes in line with that. And the next thing I know, I'm in a cheerful mood. I'm able to go out and do and what have you, you know, and just and, and encounter people in my life and operate in my little sphere of influence and existence. And it's not because I'm all that. It's because my Savior's all that. Because if it was left up to me, there have been so many times, it would just be so much easier to hibernate. And, but that's not what we're called to do. We're called to get out there and engage. We are called to be the leavening and to be the light and to be the salt. And you can't stay hid and do that. So the Lord is, is in his mercy, he's helping us get over ourselves and to realize there's a whole lot more at stake than how we feel at the moment. So he restores our souls. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you're with me. What can shadows do? You have the real protector with you when you have Jesus with you. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. God is not intimidated by your enemies. And if you will believe him for it and thank him for it and rejoice in him for it, he'll set the table right in their presence and just act like they're nothing because that's ultimately what they're destined to become is nothing. It is written in the book of Isaiah, I just told you earlier, all they that war against you shall come to nothing. So he treats them like they're nothing. He anoints your head with oil. Oh my goodness. That fresh oil. It, burdens are removed and yokes are destroyed because of the anointing. He sees to it your head gets anointed. Because what does the enemy constantly combat? Your thoughts. He's constantly trying to put invasive, uh, degrading, discouraging thoughts in your mind. You have the right to resist that. And he anoints your head with fresh oil so that those burdens can remove, be removed and yokes destroyed. My cup runneth over. What cup is that? The cup of dread? No, cup of salvation. Cup of rescue, safety, deliverance, health. All of that is what salvation means. He causes that cup to run over so you can live in a constant state of expectancy of more supply than what you have demand or ability to hold. Because that's just how good he is. That's just how big he is. And he wants this picture firm in our thinking. My cup runs over. Can't help what's happening in everybody else's cup. Can't help if they can only believe for an eyedropper full at a time. By grannies, my cup is running over. You start saying that about yourself. Start seeing that in your heart because this is God's heart for you. And I read all that to get to this. Surely, just as surely as that shepherd's out in front, Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, I want you to notice and to take comfort from this truth. The shepherd leads the sheep, but he's not left the rear unguarded. He's got some guardians lined up to take care of the rear. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. No off days. They don't sleep. They don't take vacations. <laughs> they never leave you stranded. Goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. And follow does not mean that they just kind of amble along, you know, picking their nose and looking at the daisies. Follow us from the Hebrew word raw daff, and it means to run after, to chase, to follow, to pursue to hunt, even when you leave the comfort and the protection of the fold and you get to stumbling around out there on your own, in the dark, in dangerous places, you need to know they're hunting you. Goodness and mercy is hunting you. And you need to know that there are people that are praying for you that are helping goodness and mercy hunt you down in those places where you ought not to be. Because God wants you restored. He wants you blessed. He wants you comforted. He wants you strengthened. Goodness and mercy going to chase you down. Goodness is from the Hebrew word tob. And it means good in the widest sense. Anything good that you can think of, it covers it. 
It means cheer, bounty, always more than enough. That's God doesn't know how to do skimp. It's always bounty. It means favor, which is the other word for grace. It means joy and kindness and goodness and readiness. Oh, he's always ready. And it means prosperity. Oh, my goodness. So the goodness follows you. It chases you. It has to do with your provision. It's the same word that's used in Exodus 33 and verse 19 when God responded to Moses' request to see his glory. He said, Lord, show me your glory. God says, I'll make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I'm going to make all of my cheer, my bounty, my favor, my joy, my kindness, my goodness, my readiness, my prosperity pass in front of you. His goodness is his glory manifest. Moses asked to see the glory. God showed him his goodness. The prophecy of Jeremiah 33 in verse 9 which says that the people would fear the Lord and tremble because of all the goodness and the prosperity that he procured unto his people. It's that same word again. It's Tob. God intends for people to be familiar with his goodness. This earth is going to be filled with his glory. Do you know what that means? That means his goodness manifests on every hand. One place in the scripture says that it would be full of the glory like the water covers the sea. There's no place in the sea that's not wet. There's nothing in this earth that's not going to be touched by the goodness of God. That's the reason when it's all said and done at the end of of this go-round by the Spirit, people will have no excuse for saying no to Jesus because they're going to get a chance to taste and see that He's good. Isaiah 58 and verse 8 says that the glory, the goodness of the Lord will be our rearward. Rearward is from the Hebrew word asaph, and it means to gather in, to receive, to assemble behind. So he's not left our rearward unprotected. His goodness is for our provision, and that goodness chases us and follows us down if we're following Jesus. But we have to believe and deliberately receive that goodness. It can be available. It can be all around you. And if you're ignorant of it, it's going to be hard for it to, to latch on to you. There, it will at times because of the prayers of other people. If you think you're undeserving, you throw up a wall and you block it. But if you can just humble yourself to believe God wants to lavish you with his goodness, he's even set that up as a rear guard to following you around, chasing you around wherever you go. And just let go of trying to defend yourself and just let him love on you and minister that goodness to you. It'll start showing up in your life, I guarantee it. But goodness is not the only guard that's bringing up the rear. He said, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me, chase me, pursue me all the days of my life. What a picture. Oh, my goodness. You are being chased around. I am being chased around by the goodness and the mercy of God. Mercy here is from the Hebrew word chesed, and it means the kindness, the beauty, the favor, the goodness, the loving kindness, the mercy. Hebrew chesed is the equivalent of grace, the unearned, undeserved, unmerited favor of God. That's the whole thing about grace. If it's not, if it's in any way earned, it can't be grace. So it's unearned. I've heard people say, well, I'm not going to forgive that person. They don't deserve it. Duh. None of us deserve forgiveness. It wouldn't be an act of grace if we deserved it. All of us don't deserve it. But praise his mighty name. He gave it anyway. Because he's the God of all grace. Mm. His goodness is for our provision. And his mercy, he said, grace, is for when we stumble and disobey and fail. Oh, how precious he is to make this provision for us. Goodness and mercy have been released to hunt us down, to guard us, to provide for us, to help us taste and see that God is good even when we follow the shepherd way, way back. So far back, in fact, that we can hardly even hear his voice as he talks to the sheep. He still made grace provision for you and for me. He loves us so much that he laid down his life for us so that we could have access to the limitless 
grace, and glory of our Father God. I want to read you out of the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Why did he say that? Because he believes he's going to have what he says. And he wanted to see grace minister to the life of those people. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. That's grace at work. None of us deserve that. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. So you couldn't deserve it because he chose to do it before you were ever even thought of. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Now you're not predestinated in the sense that you are preordained that you're going to get saved and somebody else is not. And it's like a game of any, many, many, mo. No, you're predestined to become a child through Jesus Christ. That's your destiny. Okay, you choose whether or not you receive Jesus. He's not manipulating that. You get to choose that. But once you choose, you are, mm, mm, mm. you have been given adoption, sonship in him. He, he did what he did, according to the book of Hebrews, to bring many sons unto glory. So, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted in the beloved. Accepted is from the Greek word karitao, and it means to grace, that is, to endue with special honor. You have been endued with special honor. You have been graced to be made a child of God in Christ Jesus. It means to make accepted, to be highly favored. So start thinking of yourself as highly favored, not to give yourself the big head, but to humble you and make you realize there is no way in any universe, on any level, you could ever earn that honor to be made a child of God. But he gave it freely through Jesus Christ. And when you receive Jesus Christ, you, you're, you're lifted up. You're raised up and seated in heavenly places in Him. You are honored to be a child of God. In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. Wow. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 9, the scripture says, But God, who is rich in mercy for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ. By grace, you're saved. By that unearned, undeserved, unmerited favor of God, you're saved. He, a Greek word, sozo, saved, healed, delivered, rescued, protected, preserved, and made whole. And has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You couldn't earn that. You couldn't force that to happen. It's all grace that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Grace is available. Grace has made the provision, but we have to believe it. By grace you're saved through faith. We have to believe that this is God's choice that he set this in motion. He made this provision out of the goodness of his heart and out of the integrity of his righteousness because he couldn't just pretend like we didn't sin. He couldn't uh, pretend like the sin element was not in us and then just you know adopt us on that. Lip. No, the stuff had to be eradicated. It had to be dealt with because he's just and he's holy. And the only way to do that, because the penalty for sin is death, the wages of sin is death, Somebody had to pay that penalty in order for him to be able to righteously and justly receive us as sons. Well, Jesus did. And that's why we celebrate 
receiving the communion of the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. That's the reason we sing about the blood. That's the reason we teach the word of God. That's the reason we share the gospel of the good news that we've been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus and invite others to come in and to receive that same gift because it's available to whosoever will. Thanks be to God. He's raising up a generation of ministers now that are letting go of trying to teach anything and everything except the simple basic truth of the gospel, of the grace of God, so that everything points back to the Father and to the Son and the wonderful work that they did for us and the wonderful things that they had planned for us before the world ever began. Goodness and mercy are chasing us, and it's time that we believe them, believe them that they are, Believe that God has made that provision. And just slow down and let them catch us. Open our mouths and start declaring, goodness and mercy are chasing me. They're my rear guard. The shepherd's out in front of me, leading me by his voice. I hear his voice and I follow him. I don't follow a stranger. And I can go out with joy and be led forth with peace. I can face whatever the day may bring because I know goodness and mercy are chasing me. And it's for my provision. It's for my protection. It's for when I stumble and mess up. You can't lose for winning if you'll just let God be God. Let me bless you. The Lord bless you and refresh you in the understanding of His love for you. The Lord quicken you according to His word and release notable miracles into your life and in the lives of your family. The Lord stretch forth his hand against the wrath of your enemies and cause you to triumph over every challenge and every evil obstacle the enemy puts in your path. Blessed are you, called and chosen one, for God himself is a crown of glory for you. May you live to be at least 120. I really, really hope you said amen to that. I can't. I can't stress enough how important it is that you get in agreement with the truths of the Word of God and how important it is to get in agreement when somebody blesses you in the name of the Lord because where two or three are agreed, our Father in Heaven does it. And it's just one of those simple little things that we say it, but do we really believe it? When you really believe it, you'll act on it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much oh, for the gift of your grace. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the power of your word. We thank you for this amazing picture of the shepherd going before us and goodness and mercy chasing us down. And I just ask you to take this today, Father, and let this soul come alive in the hearts of the people that regardless of what's happening in the natural realm. They won't leave their homes trembling and afraid to go out in public, but they will leave their homes with confidence in the invisible shield that is around them, in the guardians that you have chasing them down and bringing up the rear. Complete confidence in the shepherd who leads them to green pastures beside still waters so that their souls can be restored regardless of what's happening in the earth. Father, I just I praise you for what you're doing. You are so awesome. And I thank you. I thank you for giving wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. I thank you for singing over us. I thank you for the restoration that is taking place. I thank you that you are flooding this earth with your glory and causing righteousness and praise to spring forth before all nations. All glory and dominion be unto you, Lord. I can't wait to see what you've got in store for us. Amen. All right, dear friend. I hope you have an absolutely wonderful day. And I'll talk to you later.